explaining to them why they're a target. So the idea here at the beginning is that this is a simple explanation for exactly what makes them attractive. And you can add and remove items from here if necessary. Yeah. Just, uh, just this week, I found, um, I found uh, in a, in a uh, router report that one of my clients was being used for Bitcoin mining. So yeah, it's yeah. a really simple, clear explanation for what's going on. And if you are an employee at a company, your computer can be used, uh, let's just die, can be used uh, to reach corporate data, right? To, to, for evil, right? To get, to get the stuff that is valuable. It's not just uh, being a target. Um, the best way to actually get through all this is to deal with passwords, right? So passwords is probably the most important thing that end users don't really understand. And it's not just simply swordfish, okay? Don't have a dictionary word. There are good and bad passwords out there. We're explaining here different reasons why you might have different passwords and how you might want to track them. So there are three different topics that we're going to cover in the next few slides. Uh, what we're doing here is telling them what are some bad passwords you might ha see when you're delivering this. A whole bunch of people feeling uncomfortable because right away they start seeing their password up here. Or we've we've delivered password. this in a room, you know, a couple hundred people, and it's interesting to hear the gasps around the room as they see their password go by. We happen to know that the IT guy gives a default password of the person's first name followed by one two three. We knew that, and half the room has never changed their default password. So we said, how many people use something like uh, their first name, one, two, three? As if that was off the top of our head. And right away, you saw people do this sort of thing, sheepishly. So, and they, they use that everywhere. So make sure that standard passwords like this are bad. Don't use, here are examples of what you, what you might not want to do, obvious and common words, people's names, you know, that sort of thing. Personal information, you know, how many people have used their spouse or their kids or their dog? That's personal information you want to avoid. Um, this is the killer, right? Oh, yeah. The same password in use everywhere because they feel like they learned one. So this is an opportunity for you to start to begin the explanation of cross-site hacking um, and, and show them why it is that that won't work. And that they should um, not have, even if they think that they're doing well by creating multiple passwords, don't use a common formula, you know, like my password uh, Google, my password Yahoo, my password Gmail. You know, don't start using a common formula, that's important. So go over some things that are good ideas, at least 10 to 12, the longer the password, the better. Um, they should include numbers, upper lower char char uh, symbols. The more variety of characters, the harder it is, and the long, when it's really long, the longer it is, uh, the harder it is to, to, to break. Um, obviously, they shouldn't mean anything to anybody else, because if it's a word, they'll start remembering. Other people could remember what the password is, Adam. Well, we'll talk a little bit about how and, and, and the complexity in just a second. I want to show you a website in a second, but at least 10 to 12. The longer, the better, obviously. Um, and in the, uh, in the notes at this area, we have, um, we have several different uh, websites that you might go to. You, you should consider dropping out of the presentation at this point and showing them a password calculator that shows them both how to make a good password and... Um, uh, how quickly a password can be hacked depending on the characters in use. And we'll actually do that here just for a second. Um, passwords can be a long phrase. So one thing, I, example I like to say is something like, like, you know, 10 to 12, no. Uh, my favorite cookie is chocolate chip, exclamation point. Do you know how many millions of years that's going to take to break? So one, that is his favorite cookie, and two, he's used that as a password, which is why it's coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Bill accepts cookies. Sorry, Tom? I didn't hear you. Bill accepts cookies. Yeah. And so there, are, there are lots of different um, Diceware is another one. Why don't you talk a little bit about what Diceware is? So I have a couple of links to Diceware explanations. Anyone here using Diceware for their passwords? You may like Diceware um, as a recommendation, and you may also want to make it something you use personally. The idea is that you, you get several random words strung together. Uh, there's, there are websites that will help you make sure that the words are, in fact, random. But the concept is that humans tend to remember words better than they do um, you know, these messed up 
35 character passwords Str that don't have any symbols. connection to anything. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're incredibly difficult to hack, but you get the freedom to actually use a real word uh, so it becomes more memorable. And other password tools, which we'll talk about in a second, often offer you the opportunity to create Diceware-style passwords. Um, so this is an example of how you can tell them why uh, they don't want to use the same password everywhere. Remember a few years ago, Yahoo admitted that about three and a half million users on Yahoo, uh, it was a breach and their passwords were exposed. And what was it, about a month ago, six weeks ago, they finally admitted, no, that, that breach of about three and a half million wasn't accurate, it was everybody. Okay, so that's a big problem. Obviously, even three and a half million is a big problem. This is huge. So the idea is that Yahoo had their password database list uh, stolen, so every username and password was used, and the bad guys are going to then try that same name and password on another site. And some of those are going to work. And while they get into another site, like Amazon, they might have financial information available to them. Right? So then they've taken that financial information and they go to a financial institution and yet some of those passwords are still the same. And they get into the financial institution, whether it's a bank or a credit card company or whatever, and that's a problem. So we use this example and people go, oh, now I get it, why I shouldn't use the same And you'll password. probably have users who say, oh yeah, I had a Yahoo account, but I don't use it anymore. Right, but they still use the same password formula everywhere, so. Change the password. Or uh, so, so to breaking a password, there are lots of ways to deal with that, obviously, and, and uh, Adam was alluding to that. It's typically not this guy in his parents' basement, you know, running a little program that hacks you. Um, the forces of evil have unlimited funds and, and time, right? So if they really want to get in, they're going to get in. Uh, and the guys who really want to get in and have organized, organized crime and organized ways of getting in, they, they probably have equipment like this. To, to get in. Or steal that equip equipment. Yeah, or, or they've, they've, exactly, they've taken over that equipment somehow. So this is, again, to show your clients the path through the simplicity of their passwords and why that's not acceptable. Yeah, so there are lots of different passwords uh, that you can use, lots of different um, password type hacking applications. This and is one of them. Let me uh, make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. Um, and the presentation links directly, the, 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 uh, there's a hyperlink in the presentation to this one, and then in the notes there are a couple of other ones that you might try if you want to get more complex about what you're, uh, what you're showing. So I show this all the time to some end users who are really bad passwords and they freak out. So I tell them, okay, your password is uh, five characters and a typical 500,000, half a million passwords per second uh, attempts are going to be made, and all you're doing is using a lowercase letters. How long do you think it'll take it? And they go, oh, mm, I don't know, maybe a couple days. And I tell them, well, let's calculate. That's going to take actually just about a minute to go through every, less than a minute, to go through every possible combination of five characters of just alphabetical letters. Less than a minute. If we increase that from five to six characters, 11 minutes for every possible option. If we increase that, uh, if we go from uh, upper or lower case characters, we just increase by adding 26 more characters, we've now gone to 11 hours. If we add some digits into that and we calculate, it'll take up to 32 hours to actually go through every possible combination. Let's uh, increase the number of characters. Let's go from six to seven. And we, went, we go from 70, 32 hours to 82 days just by adding a, one extra character. Uh, how about some punctuation? 10 months. Oh, how about we go from seven to 10 characters? Okay, but let's throw 10 computers at it. Yeah, 316,000 uh, years. Uh, let's add, hey, how about 100? Sure. You know, and we've got now 3,000 years, 100 computers at it. And now if we go from 10 to, well, let's say, uh, 14, let's go, uh, let's go 16. 16 characters, 100 computers, upper, lower, and punctuation will take that many years for 16 characters to go through every possible combination. That makes sense to people, and then they understand why they need to have a very strong password. Yeah, Will? I just want to add that just because they think their password is going to take five quadrillion years, that doesn't mean that their password with some elements of a, uh, a dictionary word and some nasty elements is not going to mean that your password is going to 
Yeah, but if you're going to be using some, com some dictionary word, that's going to require some kind of manual intelligence used in there as opposed to going through every possible random combination. Yes, but if you look at the password trackers, that's exactly what they do. Yeah. They hit with dictionary first. Sure. That's not sure. Yeah, they start with dictionary and they do that. So the question is, how many passwords do you have as an end user? Adam. It's not. But the thing is, is that the, the number from four years ago was 350 billion. Sure. We were just using that as a really small number, but. And, and no, but I guess my point is, is that when trying to explain it to other people, when you start getting into it, you say anything billion per second, people's jaw jaw drop. Right. And yeah. And that's sort of the, you, you have to understand that they, I mean, that was four years ago. Right. So, so what you're saying is possible when you have that as a variable on that slide when you're demoing this, pump up the number to, from 500,000 to 3 billion right away before you even start. Yeah, play with those, play with those variables. Wait, and remember you can call back the idea of the botnet to the beginning where we talked about how you could, be, you could be harnessed for it and they might sort of go, oh wait a minute, so if my computer's been taken over it might be used to be hacking somebody else? And they're starting to see why it is that they need to protect. And it's not yes, it's not just for themselves, but as a good citizen. And it's not just 100 computers. It's 5 million computers around the world you know, that are working simultaneously on this. <laughs> there you go. And, and it's not a terrible thing to mention the cost of this stuff, too, because a lot of people don't understand that this is a resource that is both harnessed and then sold on the dark web. So you can, you can buy this level of compute power for $20 and be off and running against whatever password it is you want. So if someone grabbed your hash, they can throw it at a, you know, at a, big, a big array. And by the way, you're going to get from people, well, how am I going to keep track of all this? I have my little black book, right, of, of, of passwords. H has anybody seen this before? Yep. Yeah. How about this? <laughs> yeah, this is a real scenario. People had post-it notes. This is how they remember. Just don't do that. Tell them not to do it. This might be better because they have one source where they're logging everything, oh God. but if they lose that one source, or that one source gets stolen, the little black book. I saw this at Barnes and Noble. It was eight dollars. I, I, I comment. I saw this at a, a paper, the paper at the card store, and I said to the person, "They shouldn't be selling these because the people who are going to buy them are the people who shouldn't be using them." So yeah, you saw it at a, at a store, and people were saying, and you told them they shouldn't be buying, they shouldn't be selling this. And what do they say? Uh, well, we, we sell just, it. They just felt, well, now yeah, people the buy it. The looked at me like I had three heads, but because you know, she doesn't <laughs> understand <laughs> what you guys are talking about. Okay, so I've still seen people do something like this, use the Notes app on their phone. It's better, it's backed up in iCloud, right? Huh? Yeah, so now there's a lock button. You can lock it. And if you do that, um, if you haven't done that yet with any private notes, on, on the share sheet, there's a little padlock there that says lock the note. So if you do that, the lock has been added to that note so that when the user gets to that note, this is what they see. And they have to unlock it using whatever ID, the uh, touch ID or their face ID or even their password. Uh, and when they tap it, it asks them for their fingerprint or their face or whatever, and then it unlocks. So, that's a great way if they're not going to invest in a password manager. So we, we then go on and recommend several different possibilities. Obviously, you can use a browser-based one. We've seen all these, and we close on the one that we think is the best choice. So whatever one you have experience with, we prefer 1Password. That's what we use. So we have some screenshots here explaining what 1Password does. It keeps track of your passwords. We talk about what it does. It can also have other things. So one of the important things we might want to explain is that if there are uh, secure documents that they want to have, uh, I actually put my uh, scan of my driver's license in there because I have actually left the house once without my wallet and I was driving. And fortunately, I didn't get pulled over. But had I gotten pulled over, I wouldn't have had my license. In California, I believe you can have a replica of your license and show the, the uh, police officer if they ask you. And that works. I have my passports on there, so that if I travel and my passports get stolen, I have scans of my passport. So whatever documents are valuable to you can be stored in records. It's not just individual passwords. But you might want to teach them how to create um, secure, good, long passwords using this program. If you're on a website, it'll actually suggest good passwords. 
So here's an example of what one password might look like. This is just a demo file that they provide with the program, so I'm not giving away anything here. Um, and then an example of how you get into a website with one password. You've got a button and you type in your master password, or you can use Touch ID on a laptop. And um, it puts the information for you when you're in, and there's an iPad and an iPhone version, and they all sync together. So these are, again, again, and if you have LastPass or Dashlane or any one of those others, and you want to replace the slides with that sort of thing, feel free to. Yeah. Yeah, I find it's an hour long explanation. You could always use the built in uh, keychain. Even just a pass through keychain showing them how the, how the features work and what, what's being done for them. That's a start. That's certainly better than what they're doing. But now you're, you should, at the same time, be conveying the importance of that keychain, the importance of backups, et cetera, that go along with it. Yeah. Um, you want to make it simple enough that they'll use it. You don't want to make it more, you want to present it in such a way that it's too complex that they won't use it. But if you are talking to a corporate user, it may be that what you want to do is look into a corporate account because then we've got the teams and the sharing of specific vaults and that kind of thing, which may be an attempting, uh, we talked about that at one of our clients and they all went, oh, that's perfect, because now all of us can have that same set that's shared among us in addition to our own personal vaults. Multi-factor authentication, go into it, explain what it is. It's more than what you know, it's something you have at that time. So uh, the example that most people know about is the text going to their phone, they probably use that, especially with iCloud and some of these other services. So iCloud, Gmail, Yahoo, Facebook, enable multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication with them. Uh, there are lots of ways, that in, now we have biometrics, so we have um, you know, three-factor authentication as well. An example, again, replace it if you want to, but two-factor authentication, uh, you're typing in something, you get texted a code, you put the code in, and now you're in. So it's not only something you know, it's something you have. That's the two-factor authentication. The third factor, something you are. That's the biometric, that's the touch ID, that's the, uh, uh, the face, all that other stuff, right now. Um, touch ID example, face ID example. Uh, some people are afraid about, what the, about that information leaving, and well, I don't want Apple or these websites to have my face. Anybody ever heard that before? Does everyone feel comfortable explaining secure enclave to a client? Because okay, that, that, this is the point where you should do that. Does anybody not understand, understand a secure enclave? It's okay if you don't understand it. One or two? Okay. So the idea is that when you are re registering your thumb for the first time, or you're registering your uh, face for the first time, Apple is, the phone, the device, is creating a mathematical representation of what you're giving it and storing it in a chip in the phone in an encrypted, encoded mathematical format. That information never gets sent to Apple. The idea is that when you need to authenticate later, it then compares what it's recording at that time to what is stored in the secure enclave. And if it matches, then you're in. And you can make this very simple with clients by pointing out that if they have an iPhone and an iPad, and they've had to set their fingerprint on both of them, you can say, if, if this information were going to Apple, then the iPad could already know about your fingerprint after the iPhone has been set, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because that data is stored only on this device, never sent anywhere else. Yeah? Yep. One good thing to point out is that um, the device doesn't actually get the data out of the secure enclave to that comparison. It actually puts the, oh, you have that in there. Yeah, the apps only get a yes or no whether it matches. So the apps don't even get the information, right? It's only the secure enclave that knows whether or not there's a match. Good. So does the, does the logical structure that we're, we're passing through here seem to make sense and make for an easy explanation? And we're just still on passwords. There's a lot more. OK, now we're moving on. So we have malware. Um, Malwarebytes, thank you. <laughs> install it on every computer that we touch. Uh, if you're not using it, you should. Uh, and you will run into people who have downloaded Adware on their computer, not knowingly, and this is a great product that they find it. Um, so, 
make sure that you have some type of malware that's at least scanning for adware or anything else. Why? Because the bad guys want to get in and use your computer for something. And if not your computer, they want to use you going to their website to do something that's beneficial to them. Um, websites on the Mac, uh, viruses on Mac, rather. Uh, I don't know if there's ever been a documented virus on Mac OS since OS X, per se, a virus by definition. I don't think there have been. Yeah, and you can certainly use this as an opportunity to explain XProtect, which is something that a lot of users don't have clues on their computer, and it's nice to have this sense of, oh, okay, I'm, I'm actually being looked out for. How many people have never heard of XProtect before? Talk about that. So XProtect is, uh, is built into Mac OS, and updates come from Apple when, whenever Apple decides that it's going to do an update. And they're basically fingerprint files for files that should not be on your computer. So if you have, for instance, downloaded an application that's considered malware, Apple can disable it from their, from their level from running on your computer. And websites, too, and domains and things that you shouldn't be, be able to go to. They can, they can update XProtect overnight with every map running in the world if they need to. And they go every map, every, you, you don't know that necessarily. And the end user certainly doesn't know that. But that, that's a good thing from a security point of view. It would be Safari only, yes. Uh, ransomware, uh, it's always been a problem in the PC world. It's starting to be a little bit of an issue I've seen with some Mac users. Again, uh, you want to backup, backup, backup. Malware is downloaded and your volume gets encrypted. So you want to explain what ransomware is. Uh, and then the bad guys ask for ransom. And sometimes, and more often than not, uh, you may not get your data back. They just You just paid money in Bitcoin. You're never going to get to see that money again. And you may not get your data back. All. And this is a great moment to explain the, the value of rotating backups. Uh, if you get hit with a ransomware uh, encryption scheme, your data gets locked, but if your backup is connected to it, then your backup gets locked too. And so do the network shares, right? So you're one attack vector in the company that is now connected to a network share, and now you've locked all the files on a share for everybody else. So we're definitely looking for the rotating backups. It's just an opportunity to, to upsell. So you as an IT person have to make sure that there is a secondary backup system that you can, you can restore from right away if necessary uh, that might not have been, been hit by that ransomware. Um, man in the middle, if you've ever heard of this sort of thing, this is a little bit more complex and somebody really has to work hard at this, but it happens. You are on a computer and you want to try to access a website. This is the normal uh, method. You go through the internet and you're connecting. The man in the middle actually is now spoofs the certificates somehow, and he is actually pretending to be both parties at the same time. So you think you're talking to a server, the server thought thinks it's talking to an end user, and the guy is capturing the data going in both directions. This is very simplistic, but easy enough for an end user to understand. So that's why you want to make sure you're up to date with security updates and all that kind of stuff. Sorry? That there is a man in the middle attack, or actually what it's probably doing is that there's a certificate that is malformed, and it warns you that this could be a man in the middle attack. That's the wording that I've seen both Firefox, uh, Safari, and Chrome all do in the last couple months. Yeah. Uh, denial of service, but we know what that is. But. So again, the, uh, the idea that you, you might become part of this, uh, or your users might become part of the, uh, the denial of service attack someplace else. So your, your computer being hijacked to bother someone else. And so this, we cover several other things here. And again, these are slides that can be turned on or off, depending on the level of introduction you want to give to people. You can, you, if you love talking about malvertising, and I can think of a few people here who might, um, <laughs> then you might want to expand and have a, more, a couple more slides on that, that sort of thing. Um, Make sure that they understand the concept of a secure website. Did the cartoon get pulled out? Uh, possibly. There's a great XKC. It's in there. Oh, it is. It's okay. just hidden. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, there's a secure website uh, when they're connecting to a, a bank or a financial transaction or something like that. Um, and you want to make sure that they understand when they are doing any financial transaction, if they're not on a fake website and they are on a encrypted secure Site for their transaction, whether it's a bank or 
Amazon or whatever, and teach them how to identify a secure website, HTTPS, instead of just a plain HTTP connection. Yes? It's a great add in for um, any website that has authentication with a password manager. If your password manager is not offering to build the information in for you as it's always done for you in the past, don't go type it in and override your password manager. Very, very, very good point. This is a good thing for the end user. So that if they are using something like a 1Password that suggests a password, if it's a fake version of that website, 1Password is not going to suggest the password. Because it realizes it's not the real thing. So don't, as Will said, don't they then say, like oh. But if 1Password is not putting your, one, your eBay credentials up in there, yeah. <coughs> then don't override it and put it in manually yourself. Exactly. So how do you know it's encrypted? Well, when you're looking at the site, Apple's actually hiding the HTTPS connection. Several versions of, of Safari ago, they started doing that. But if you click in the URL bar, you will see the little uh, padlock. But if you click in the URL bar, you will actually see the full URL at that point. And it will tell you that it is indeed an HTTPS connection. The padlock is also a giveaway. And you and want your users to understand this. Um, you want them to be vigilant about that sort of thing. It's not just, yeah, it's not just banking and shopping sites. Yeah, always look. I do. I still do. Lots of other common attack vectors. Lots of ways they can get in. Phishing is one way. Where they can throw out a net and hopefully somebody will get in. What is phishing? Explain phishing. Email phishing is one example. Here's an email I got for uh, a purchase that was made on the iTunes store. And I looked at it and I said, a $50 in-app purchase for a game? I don't think so. And I looked at the game, I don't even, no, 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 that's not real. And so I clicked on the from, teach them to look at the from. The from address, here you may not even be able to see it from where you are, it says receipt, without the T, at invoice-apple.mac.com, which is not at all legitimate there. And if you hover, over links, not click, but just hover, teach the people to hover, you will see where it's going to go to. And there's a little shortened URL. There's a shortened URL at the same time. One with a document, oh, document, D-O-K-U-M-E-N. No C for documents, and there's no T at the end. Again, why would it have a documents number if it has an order number? I get clients sending me these things, asking if they're legitimate, and oftentimes I don't even get to answer on the, on the first sending of the message because it's been caught by my spam filter. And I have to go look through and say, oh yeah, okay, so this guy's wondering about that, and you know, respond. But the if, they would, if they would just take a moment and learn about this, yeah. it'd be fine. The document number and the cancel order both go to the same URL. And look at this. Visit iTunes support it takes me to google.com. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm sorry. One more thing. Does anybody see something really glaringly obvious? It's a forward. It's a forward. Yeah. Look at that. So what I was going to say is interesting because my understanding with phishing messages, in fact, is that they want them to be bad because if they're too good, that people will click through and then immediately fail. You know, they'll immediately figure it out the next time. They want people who will fall for this. And so I don't quite know how you tell that to <laughs> them. So basically, they want you to be stupid. They want it? stupid users. Yeah. Um, right. So people who will just not notice at all fall for this is actually pretty good, honestly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of them where you just go, you've got to. This, this was last week. And so, but, but so, you know, this one actually is probably too good for its own, own use because you know, it's going to fool people who will never fall for the, the next function down the phone. Yeah. It's only the first click, right? Mm -hmm. you can't keep going. Right. Um, but this is email vision, right? This is another one. If you get another email, don't bother looking at this, but if you wonder what this is and you want to see, get some more information about it, if the user can be trained to understand what a mail header looks like and, and that sort of thing, that might help. But there's a tool that I like where they can drag the in-mail, Apple Mail, you can drag the actual blue part, the actual item that's blue, you can drag it onto an application called MailSpy. 
I'm going to mail Spy. I believe it might be free now on the App Store. If not, it's like one or two dollars on the Mac App Store. You drag it, and it gives you a geolocator as to where that mail originated from, based on the IP. You could do it yourself, right? You could copy and find it in the header and look it up. But this, for an end user, might be a little bit more. Uh, I'm still uh, not sure some of my users would understand what they're doing, but yeah. <laughs> So types of phishing, email phishing? So uh, we can get more sophisticated with phishing, and then the specific thing that I like to communicate here is how one of my clients started a transaction for $25,000 based on an email that came from the, or purportedly came from the CEO of the company asking for a wire transfer. And because of that, we've changed the policy of that company that every wire transfer needs a physical signature and a physical meeting. The bot bad guys actually did their homework to find out who's whom in the, in the company. Yeah, and that's a, a really good example to know that they, that people really want to dig in. And you may think that your position at the company isn't all that important, and realize, oh wow, it actually is. Web phishing, this still happens. Anybody ever help dealt with this? Now we're on your computer, please call this 800 number, and then they call you after they've already spent 500 bucks. My mother just three weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So she still doesn't understand what you do. Yeah, she still really doesn't understand what you do then. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Same as cash. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, social engineering. And we, we're, this is, we're, we're actually nearing the end. We wanted to leave room for a lot of questions, a lot of uh, talk. Um, social engineering is probably the uh, most used and effective method of hacking somebody. Uh, the talk is actually designed to be about an hour, 20 minutes to an hour and a half if you're delivering it. You can shorten it if you want to remove some thought. We're, we're racing through. Okay, so that's why we wanted to, we're entering relatively close, so we're close to the end. But we wanted to make sure that you guys uh, have time to give comments. This is probably the most important thing that they have to be aware of. Uh, and, and the web phishing, you know, sort of leads into this. Um, the bad guy is really just a good or bad actor. You know, if they're, if they're dealing with uh, uh, phone calls and people who might show up with a fake badge at a company, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes they rely on the person's emotions, and they're they're making pleas to you. No, I gotta get this project done. And you will understand my job is on the line. And blah. Oh, okay, we'll let you in or whatever the case may be. So be vigilant. Um, unfortunately, this is a term I've heard. There is no security patch for human error. I replaced the word error. I replaced the original word with the word error. It had stupidity on there, and I don't want people who are seeing this presentation to feel like you're calling them stupid. So I replace that. Just and put the word stupidity back in if you feel like it. Okay. Um, but make sure that they understand to say no. Okay? That they, they shouldn't give in. We are talking to people about the cyber security that we just had with that. And in light of that, we're asking people how secure the internet passwords are. What do you use for internet passwords? Um, you know, I even stick to my last name. Uh, I can stick to my last name on the pivots. Um, maybe like a, a hashtag or something. Or a, I didn't play last name. Walker. Walker. <laughs> Walker. 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 We're having problems with some of the audio here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because the and the second video wasn't that we're gonna show doesn't play well through the audio system here for some reason or other. So I'm gonna change the uh, audio output to our. Uh, we go. 
you probably want to turn it off. Yeah, I was plugged. Is it on? Yeah. See it okay? She's like, wants to help. 
you know, so she's literally burning one of the receptionists at our, one of our clients. And the names have been changed. <laughs> yes. yes. The most common or the easiest method of gaining access to that side of thing is to walk in, be confident, and carry a clipboard. Yep. <laughs> because it looks like you were there on official business. And? And it works. And? A clipboard and? A badge. Yeah. I don't have to say anything on the badge. <laughs> Anybody can make a badge for five bucks buying the right materials and staples. Honestly, you can. And it, that badge can say Comcast, and they'll never know. When I see your network login, please. Yeah. Just gotta test it. Yep. Um, identity theft, obviously. Uh, other types of social engineering, they want to steal information, buy a house in your name, and that sort of thing. You, I actually, actually might get some, someone who quit or was fired and wants to come back and hurt the company somehow. And this, this is the biggest problem because they know too much. How many of you would have a, have a client that is a company and you've come in one day and somebody's no longer there and they explain to you, oh yeah, we let that person go or whatever. You didn't get the call in advance, right? You're the one who manages all the IT assets. They fired somebody who had access to all those IT assets from inside, from outside the company and they didn't tell you. So that door's been open all this time, and it may stay that way unless they explicitly say we want you to go. And Sometimes I get calls from home from some employees who are having some problems, and maybe it's a VPN issue, and I have to work with them. And if this guy got fired yesterday, and I didn't get notified, I'm going to help him. I don't know. So you need to keep, you need to be on. This is one of the things where you need to tell management of companies that you're working with that you need to be informed immediately when somebody gets let go. Um, Anyone here first time in this? I'm going to pause this one just to give you a little bit of an of a intro. You don't necessarily have to give the intro to your clientele. This is a clip of a much longer TV show where the interviewer went to a DEF CON conference in Vegas, a security conference, where they're all hackers and they tell you don't use the ATMs, don't use the Wi-Fi, don't use anything because you're going to get hacked there. And his point at this part of the segment of the, of the show is, and if the link again takes you to the full 30 minute show, so this is just a few minutes in, in, in the show, where he's actually interviewing somebody in the show uh, who's talking about social engineering and how they can actually hack a company using social engineering. The interviewer, the reporter himself, has no idea of what this social engineering thing is, so they're going to try to hack him. Anyone here first time in the SEC yet? I invited Chris to hack me uh, with his team, uh, but they're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. We help people with human security issues by testing vulnerabilities for, uh, for like a network test, but it's for the people network. We test those vulnerabilities, see where the holes are, and then help people learn so they can patch them. Can we try some of this? Can we try some? Yeah, see the works. We, we probably could uh, have our star visitor here make some phone calls. <laughs> Let's do it. Sure. You want to do a sample of phishing call? What's phishing? Phishing is voice solicitation, and basically, um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Okay. You, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm gonna spoof from your number, so it's gonna look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. I my baby. I'm sorry. <laughs> my my husband's like. We're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, yeah, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through the text message. Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Okay, Jessica uses 
using my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed up with this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they, <laughs> they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password right now because it's just my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. So, Scary. when you show this to users, they're going to have the same reaction that you do. And obviously, play with that for a little while. But then remind them that all of their, their text messages that are confirming their identity are going through their cell account. And now make sure you talk about the importance of having control over that account and having it properly locked down. Uh, because a lot of people don't do that and don't know that and don't pay enough attention to it. But that's sort of your final line of defense, right? Everything comes as an authorization to your phone. And if somebody is... Exactly. So you could be really vigilant and follow all the steps that we talked about, but it's the cell phone company that dropped the ball here. So it's the employees there that need to be trained on this stuff. And who knows? Your clients might be AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile. Make sure they understand this stuff. And, and I just tested my, uh, my AT&T account because there is a code set up on it. And I called up and, and tried to use it without the code. And then I tried to fake the code and tried to say I lost the code. And they stopped me all the way through. So that was good. They at least did have my back. When we last did this presentation at a client's office, we ended around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and a guy who works with us was there that afternoon to deal with whatever his issue, the issues were, because that was his day to be there. And he reported back to us saying that he spent the entire rest of the afternoon helping people change their passwords on every possible website that they were on, because they just got totally, totally freaked out by this. And we thought, okay, good, we did our job. Yeah? Is it important to note that your client may not be the, the, the intended target. It could be your client's client. Right. So, um, you know, uh, I have clients in the government sector or in the pre-government sector where I have to make sure that they understand that they are a vector to their clients. And uh, one of them in particular is, sits on the board of several Fortune 500 companies. And so I have to, every month we have this phone call talking about security. It is so important that- And, and you're right. Let's simplify that even more. When they say to you, when the client is saying to you, I don't really have important stuff on my device, okay? All I say, this shuts them down right away. I say, you have my mobile number on there, right? Well, yeah. I don't want my mobile number compromised. So it's your responsibility to keep that private. Bingo, end of story. I don't care about, right now, even going further and trying to talk about government stuff. I, it's my, and I, this is somebody they know. Now you're appealing to their, to their emotions, to them, and they can understand it right then and there. Very good point. But let's whittle it down to something that they can understand right then and there and change it, and that gets them over it. So there are lots of methods of protecting your phone and other devices. I had to look at that picture several times before I realized what was going on. <laughs> you want to make sure that you go through every possible software update uh, relatively soon after they get uh, uh, pushed out. You want to review what they do. Look at, the, look at the tech notes of the software updates to be aware of what they're fixing. Uh, once the software update is published, Apple typically publishes what it fixes, what hole it fixes, which means if Apple is now broadcasting that there was a hole there, the people that are not protected are now possible victims by the bad guys who didn't know that that exploit existed. Essentially much more vulnerable. So software updates, whether it's for Mac, whether it's for Windows, whether it's for iPhone, keep up to date. Uh, anybody found out, uh, did anybody do an update since yesterday? Did you guys know, notice? 11 point, iOS 11.1.2 came out yesterday with two fixes that were official, but there were lots of other little things under the hood that they didn't actually say. So they fixed well. Uh, encrypting the data is important. So that was kept up. On, uh, <laughs> That's not the one I was talking about. Um, again, your point, Will. It might not be your data. 
It might be corporate data, it might be government data, information about others. People don't understand sometimes what encryption means, but if you show them something like this and say, here's, here's a text file, you know, you're writing a letter, this is a speech from Kennedy, and after it's been encrypted, it might look like this, unintelligible. And only if they have a decryption key, the right person who's the, the recipient of this uh, email or message, then they can decrypt it to read it again. So an, an encrypted file, as it travels through the internet or through the, the Wi-Fi space or wherever it happens to be, um, you know, not necessarily usable. Uh, files and folders can be encrypted. Many applications have built-in encryption. You can create encrypted disk images. You can create encrypted files and folders. You can encrypt your drive with file vault. How many people do not encrypt their drive with file vault? Oh, well, that's very nice. That's say. great. Not a single hand went up. And you can encrypt external USB drives. You can encrypt your time machine backups. If you've got a mobile user and they're traveling with their laptop and they have a little pocket drive for time machine and they've got file vault on their laptop, why don't they have file vault on their time machine backup? The time machine backup should be encrypted too. Right? So you can get those. Um, and firmware encryption. How many people do not use firmware encryption? One, two, three. This prevents a user who gets your physical access to your computer from booting the computer from an external drive unless they know the firmware password. I can't, I can't think of a good reason for not using it. Um, and from an IT standpoint, I, I really feel like it should be applied. It used to be that you could remove the firmware encryption by just changing the RAM modules. That was pre-2011 or something like that. And since then, now the only way you can get that removed is to take it to an Apple authorized repair center or uh, an Apple uh, store. They have tools, that they can, and you have to prove that you own the device. Otherwise, you're stuck. Um, when it comes to passwords, make sure that somebody knows your password. This is also good for estate planning and should really be thought of in advance. Um, there's some great articles out there, and there are a couple of companies that offer services for this. Uh, essentially, you want your passwords to be somewhere in escrow with a plan for how they would be accessible, and you need the other person to know that that is, that is in place. Uh, so if you've got a third party that's holding your passwords for this person, there may need to be some proof that the person is incapacitated or that uh, you know, you've been, you've been uh, you, you died or whatever, and then they're able to get to that information. I've dealt with older clients who, uh, well, one of, the, one of the spouses passes away and the other one needs to get in, takes some secure information on the computer and needs passwords to some websites and doesn't know what the passwords are. Yes. Um, and whether it's a keychain or whether it's a one password type application, if someone, if a spouse does not know the one password password, you're in big trouble. It, there may, it, if you are doing estate planning, if you are planning for incapacitation and that sort of thing, there may need to be a document in place that authorizes this person to act as you in those areas, so a form of a power of attorney. Um, but consider social media accounts as well. Don't just stop with financial. Uh, think about all the different digital footprints that you leave and make sure that someone else can, can properly deal with them. It's not like walking into a house that the, you know, the sheriff's department knows that you have access to get in. Which means you should be documenting, or the people that you're working with should be documenting all the stuff that they even know in their head. They know the password, but document it because someone else is going to need to know that at some point. Yeah? Make sure the spouse knows you exist. Okay, that's a really good point. 
right? So if you're working with a, an older lady and she's no longer around, make sure her husband knows that you're the guy that can help. In that case, come. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, one thing that can really be useful is to actually document, you know, what to do. One, one Exactly, safe positive box. Safe, and the other person or people know how to access that information. They have access to your safe deposit box or to the safe or wherever it is, but a criminal wouldn't have that. Yeah. Good. So. Adam, take the mic. So uh, uh, it's no longer no longer my specific business, but uh, I will note that Take Control has a couple of really good books on these topics. Take Control of Your Passwords covers passwords in specific, and Take Control of Your Digital Legacy talks a lot about what will happen to your data if you can't get to it, which might be because you're not around, but it might just be because you're incapacitated. Right. So it's got a lot of good advice in that, and so if you just want to sit down and really look through all the recommendations, Joe Kissel wrote both of those, they're, they're, they're fabulous. TakeControlBooks.com. Okay, and we're gonna move on. Uh, let me save the question just to the end, okay. Uh, VPNs, this is also important these tunneling things that you need to know. Explain to them why they need a VPN, what is a VPN, um, some of the traffic can go through a VPN, some people still don't understand what a VPN is, so we have little diagrams and animations that you can use, a typical home network, and they need to connect to a corporate or business institution or some other internet uh, service, and uh, they're just going through the cloud. But with a VPN, um, at a Starbucks, for example, or a coffee shop, uh, they're sharing that Wi-Fi network with a whole bunch of people. They need to get onto a business server, um, and, uh, and then there might even be a firewall for that corporate uh, account. So the VPN creates an encrypted tunnel which breaks through the firewall and puts that user on the network even though they're outside the physical building. Make sense? This is just a little animation you can use to explain the concept of a VPN. And once they're connected to the internal assets of a company, if they still need to get out to the internet, the, their network of traffic is still going out to the internet through the VPN and back. Make sense? That is an optional setting. Of right. course. Right. Of course it is. And we covered that in the slide before. Just, just so and if they have the ability to have a two-factor authentication, this is an example I use with a couple companies. How many people have an RSA token that they use for some companies? The idea here is, I have an ID, I have a PIN number, my password is actually 10 characters long, and the first four characters are, 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 are is a PIN in my head. The remaining six characters of that password are generated by this device, and that number changes every 60 seconds. So that's a very high level uh, type of, and it's, again, it's something you have in addition to something you know. And when you hit this slide, it's not a bad idea to point out that security is a constantly evolving thing, and that these tokens had all been violated, they'd all been hacked, and they had to be recalled by the company and reissued. Every single one of all the millions that were distributed around the company, they had to redistribute all the ones. There are commercial VPN services for end users, not just uh, corporate ones. Uh, so let them know that if they want to sign up for uh, a commercial one like Encrypt.me or TunnelBear, those are available for about 5 or $10 a month, and even less if you prepay for a full year. And that way it allows you to, to surf the internet or get your email safely from wherever you have wherever you happen to be and not have to worry about the hotel or the business internet or the coffee shop or wherever you happen to be. Yes, well. It's important to pick a VPN provider that does not have uh, connection logging because if they see you coming in from a VPN endpoint, they will go straight to that VPN tunnel. The authorities will go straight to that VPN provider and say, I need to log. Right, right. So some of those up there do actually so it's very important to look at the feature set, and you will pay more for the ones that offer no blocking. Yeah. And legal issues aside, some people use VPNs to, to pretend like they're coming from a different country in order to use media assets that are English alliance. Yeah. This is probably BBC. something you've seen. Yeah, if yeah. you want to get the BBC streaming the BBC, you have to be within an area where the BBC actually broadcasts. Um, so you get a you know an English VPN. Home, home network security, lots of things uh, you want to understand. Make them understand what a router is, 
Uh, cable modems sometimes are routers as well. You may want to have them turn off the routing feature so they, they can use their own router, have full control of the router, and just turn the, the modem into a bridge. So and there may be features that they want from a more effective router. Like, I think, uh, the next slide that I think uh, Firewall? Yep, so you can have a home firewall that you get, you get full control over. Um, you may want to be able to, uh, to control access to the internet. If you've got children, you may want to be able to point out that, yes, we can turn off the internet for the kids at a certain time, filter where they're going, etc. This, this is an example of a device, device called Cujo, C-U-J-O. I have not used it, we've, we've been in demos, but it looked pretty cool. It's a $250 device, um, and it lets you have complete control over everything and traffic for individual MAC addresses and computers and certain hours of the day for specific people and certain websites and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's great for, it's made to be very user-friendly, so it's got a little bit, the, the, the eyes actually go up and down and whatever, depending on the configuration, to make it happy. Um, and uh, it tells you more or less uh, what it's doing. Cujo's one. Another one, which is more of a serene type of product, uh, it's called Dojo. Uh, this one, same kind of thing. So best practices for home firewalls, you want to make sure these people are doing their own software updates. They change the default passwords. I've heard of a, uh, just while, you, while you're dealing with this, uh, this kind of network here, I've heard of a consultant who used to put an expiration date on routers and other networking gear in the server closets and in the houses that he worked on, because this way he was able to make sure that people would replace the things with newer, better technology when that time came. So if you imagine that you've got a router and it's, you know, it's an older router and they don't do any firmware updates for it anymore and it's vulnerable, but it's just been sitting there doing its job for the last eight years, you don't really have any incentive to change it. You may want to think about having your clients have the idea of an expiration date for the technology in their head. And if it's a complicated router or firewall, whatever system you're setting up, and it has the ability to save the configuration into a file so you can reload it later, do that. Save configuration files. Verify the port mapping works, explain what port mapping happens to be, um, and that sort of thing. We have Internet of, uh, Internet of Things security, things that we need to consider, right? Because now we have more than just computers in the house. We have smart refrigerators and thermostats and cameras and all that kind of stuff. And we have lights and speakers and Alexa that you speak to and, wow, who knows what's, what they're listening to. We have the HomePod coming up and the Sonos and Google Home. And, yeah, Eddie. I have just a comment on this. Um, UPnP is also something that can be dangerous. Um, we had a client, a, a, a CEO who had a, a, a domestic person come in with a, a, a compromised Windows laptop, and the way it worked was it would trigger UPnP in their, at that time, regular like Comcast gateway, or Files gateway, actually, and started transmitting audio and video out to Russia. Wow. So UPnP, if you don't know about it, is universal plug and play. It's a feature on a lot of routers these days. It tends to make it easier to have a router in the home because you don't have to go and explicitly set ports to open and close as necessary. By default, it's turned on on the Apple Airport Express. And so it's Airport Extreme, right? Yep. The router will hear the request from a client to allow traffic on a certain thing and respond to it and allow that to go through. So it may be a feature that you want on or off, depending, and as Andy said, it is a, it is a vulnerability. So when you're dealing with devices in the home, always make sure that they change the default router, the default password, adjust the settings, turn off features that you don't want, don't leave everything on. If there are things you don't need, understand what those things are and turn them off. Explain to those people what those things are. Ben has a great use of multiple devices in his home by doing this. So I, I had a, a client that I got called in on where they had, uh, they had literally hundreds of devices that were being controlled by the crash front system, and then they had um, a streaming media server, and then they had a family that wanted to be able to use the internet. And they were wondering why things didn't work. And it's like, well, yeah, because they're all on the same network. There's no bandwidth left. But when it comes down to security, it's not a bad idea to look at the devices that are in the home and divide them up according to what you want in terms of security for them. So if you've got cameras, perhaps they are not allowed to be accessed from outside except through a single port or a single method that you decide is the right way to reach them. So they might be on their own subnet inside the house, and that's subnet for updates or things like that. Right. So if you want, if you wanted to allow them to be updated, you would explicitly allow that for a certain period of time, and then you lock it back down again. So consider breaking up networks, especially on when it comes to Internet of, of Things devices in your home, or the home of the people that you're working with, or when you're explaining this to IT folks, 
who actually go out and do this stuff as well, make sure they understand that they can create multiple subnetworks. Office security, when you are uh, working with a company, make sure that those users that you're speaking with talk to their IT department to understand what their IT's expectations are for security. They understand, usually some companies and employees have to sign off on a use case, uh, uh, you know, the way they have to actually behave with digital devices as far uh, as the company is concerned. Uh, remember, tell them it's not your data. It's the company's data, and you are responsible for protecting it. And if you have any security concerns, questions about, I didn't sure, I wasn't so sure, sure if this was legitimate or not, make sure that your users talk to their IT department. So this particular slide becomes really important when I'm delivering it, both because of the talk to IT stressing at the front. I want them to feel like they should ask me for policies so that they know what it is they should be doing. But also the last point, I want them to feel now, because we've been through quite a lot of material and hopefully their eyes are a bit wider and a little more concerned, I want them to then take concerns to me directly because really the stuff that we, we go out and look for, that we kind of have an easy way to know. The random thing where somebody says, yeah, there's been somebody working in the, in the uh, phone room for the building next door and you didn't know about that. Maybe you want to know about that. So they should be mentioning it to you and you want to make that door be clear to them. Travel security. This is an issue that deals with uh, people who might travel outside the country, whether it's personal or for, for work. We have clients that do that, that travel to China all the time for manufacturing, and they need to make, take their computers with them sometimes. So what do you do when it comes to travel security? Uh, hotels have shared, often unsecured networks. Um, who knows what else is in the room? That clock radio may be a device that has a microphone in it. Maybe I'll watch too many James Bond movies, I don't know. But why, why risk it? Um, the safe in the room may not actually be safe. Especially if there's a key that is used to override when people forget their combination. Who has access to that key? And depending on the model, if you do a quick search on the internet, you'll often find the override password, passcode for the, uh, for the safe. And then you realize that, like, yeah, it's okay if I yeah, anybody ever notice those in-room safes are usually not bolted anywhere and they're battery operated? Okay, I'll just leave that. <laughs> so encrypt your devices uh, before they leave. That might be a good idea. Add a firmware password to your devices. Separate the devices that you use for travel from what you use while you're in the country working. And always use a VPN. So make sure that people who travel outside the country have VPNs available to them. And bring up the possibly difficult to understand concept of you may not be able to bring your data with you into the country that you're trying to go to. Um, this it is, may be that your, 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 um, your data is too valuable to carry on a laptop out of the country. And you might be compelled to open the device, whether you're leaving or arriving somewhere else or coming back to this country. Forever, uh, and again, we're not lawyers, but what is it, something with the uh, Fifth Amendment that says that you can be compelled to give up something, you cannot be compelled to give up something you know, but you can be compelled to give up something you have, your face, your thumb, that sort of thing. So if you deactivate the uh, face ID or the thumb ID, touch ID, that actually adds a hurdle for people to get over in order to access your data. Yeah? Uh, we, we published an article about uh, Dylan Ford crossing into this, um, and while it's true that you cannot be compelled to unlock your device, they can certainly make it difficult for you. You can be compelled to stay there. Of course. Or they can be compelled you to keep your device. You know, they can hold your device. So you want to be really careful what you do there. And you don't want to just thumb your nose at them, right? Absolutely. So and one of the possibilities is that you, you teach that. your users how to blank their device before they cross the border. Um, also, if you uh, if you have one of the uh, older iPhones in iOS 11, they added a feature that if you press the lock and unlock button five times very quickly, it will turn off the biometrics, so your thumbprint no longer unlocks the phone. It it it, it requires a passcode to be open. Um, and in five the, clicks. And in the newer one, it's uh, pressing uh, both side both side buttons brings up. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Um, so you may want to uh, wipe and reload it from a cloud backup later. That means you wipe, you're traveling with an empty laptop. 
And once you get where you're going, you uh, establish a VPN and download your assets at that point. And before you leave, you may even want to uh, uh, delete your assets. And in extreme cases, you may want to actually have um, uh, disposable hardware where you just buy something in another country, use it, connect to a travel a, a, a VPN service, wipe it when you leave, and just go home without anything. Just leave it for the hotel staff. <laughs> Make somebody really happy. So, as we wrap up, be vigilant. These are the things that, that the takeaways that people need to know. Okay? Avoid free Wi-Fi and only use trusted networks. Don't connect to free Wi-Fi as the SSID. Okay. Um, realize that obviously others are on the network too. Um, there are things that are happening in the background that you're not necessarily actively doing that are transmitting data over the network. And that's something that you need to be aware of. Using VPNs, don't click on things you don't recognize, don't install software you don't know. Matt Keeper. <laughs> um, if the phone rings and said, we just got information about your Windows computer that's compromised, can we connect to you? This is, this is Windows support. And if they have a funny accent and you know you're an all-Mac shop. I would probably hang up. I probably will keep them on the phone for half Yeah, I have, <laughs> they know, has a, a Windows uh, VM that they, they're ready to spin up the moment those call, the guys call. And they give them the IP number, it's a real-world IP, and they connect, and they just go to town and have fun with them over and over and over. So these are the action items that we want people to take action on right away. And this is sort of the last slide, and the idea is that after we've scared the crap out of you, here are things you can actually do. So they set device. a long passcode on your phone, on your iPad, a computer. Change your passcode on your phone if you're really concerned from a numerical code to a long password that brings up our right. alphanumeric uh, uh, keyboard. Um, turn on Touch ID and use it. It's, it's convenient and it's, it's actually uh, uh, pretty good. Uh, use two-factor authentication when it's offered. Apple iCloud. Uh, all Apple IDs, actually, in all the services, not just iCloud. Uh, Gmail, Yahoo, Facebook, Twitter, all these services that are cloud-based uh, internet services, and banks, for that matter, um, should have to have multi-factor authentication Use it. Encrypting your documents with corporate approval, right? Yeah, this actually matters. You don't want your users to go off and start encrypting the documents with their own passcode and never telling you what they are, so you can't actually help if they get fired or, or leave or something. People in IT should know that, or somebody should know in the company what the passwords are to get into the corporate information, that you Excel spreadsheets that are relevant to the business. Use a password manager somehow, one of the things that we talked about, use it. Uh, protect your mobile phone accounts, we saw that video, why you wanted to do that. Um, and where are your recovery emails being sent? So and have you applied decent security to that account? Because if somebody hacks that account first, and then start sending the information for recovery there, they own you. And I don't care about what type of computer presentation you're giving. Somewhere in there, you should always be telling the people, backup, backup, backup. Yeah. Right? So always have some backups. So, good security isn't simple, and it's certainly not convenient, but you have hoops to go through and make sure that they feel that they're doing their good job. So, thanks for the presentation as we are sitting through this. You can guys will have this full keynote, and you can edit it and use it as needed. Just leave our names on the first title slide. Does and this seem like something that will be useful to you? Yes. Good. I'm and some, when you are giving presentations and you're giving slideshows, you, some, how many people were here last year and saw my presentation on giving presentations? And one of the things I learned from Adam before that presentation was a, a website called pexels.com, P-E-X-E-L-S. I like using full screen images that are really high quality, that are uh, I'm licensed for reuse, royalty free. And although there are companies like Shutterstock and all those kind of things, I love Pexels. And I collect, uh, I have a special photos library of just images that are cataloged and tagged for reusing. And those are essentially um, Creative Commons, uh, even without attribution on most of the photos, which are free. So we have links to those here. So uh, if you have any questions,
now would be a good time. How much time do we have, Andy, for questions? We have uh, about three minutes, but okay. we can take a few extra. One point that I wanted to bring up was, uh, you, you, you mentioned it, the, the, the kind of social engineering where someone comes in and says they're working on the phone closet for the company next door. Ben, you talked about that. It's important to train your corporate users, whoever are the ones answering the door, the receptionist, or is like, you know, the, the EA, the executive assistant, this could happen and we would never know. They could come in, do their thing, leave. Everyone, you know, someone gave them access to the closet, the phone closet, and they never, it never occurs to them to mention it to us. And then six months later, you find out that there was some sort of a tap on, you know, on the, on, after the ONT between, before your network, so it can happen. So the point of this presentation really is all about us feeling so strongly about user and user security and educating users about security. We went to the effort of giving you guys and making MacTech attendees have a free keynote file that they can use. You don't have to use this at all. Just do it. Do something to educate all the users you work with on a, on a, on a regular basis and train people on good uh, <coughs> But if you do something cool with it, please tell us. Let us know. We'd love to hear. This um, would be awesome to uh, advertise on Facebook or wherever and just get a hotel room for the afternoon and invite your clients and your friends of client, clients of friends, to come in and, and sit with you for an hour and watch this presentation because Great idea. It, is, it is a perfect segue into increasing your customer count. Um, because you are the person of authority with a fantastic presentation. Exactly. So thank you. Talk to your local library. So Will is suggesting that you invite a client to a hotel room. Just want to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk to your local library and make it a workshop. You know, that's for, available for free for folks in the neighborhood. And make sure you have a staff and business first. One suggestion for your opening slides where people don't feel they're a target. The bad guys don't necessarily know what you have, they're just going doing random searches. Mm -hmm. and, and to elaborate, to paraphrase what Will said, is that they're looking for a weakest link. Right. So you they know, don't know that you have valuable information. They do when your client has an Excel file on your desktop, on their desktop called passwords. <laughs> <by themselves. laughs> right? Which one of my clients had and got stolen. Just hook up a real firewall for a week and show them who's trying to connect with SSH. Good point. Yes. We have a server. Now, if hackers got into this, they would be mortally disappointed. But it is constantly being attacked by the Russians, the Chinese, people in the Philippines, people in the Ukraine. It's full of old railroad land documents, but um, Very good point. the amount of effort is incredible. If you don't have access to a live thing that you can show during a presentation, record a screen video of live logs of you know, live attacks, and include that in your presentation so you can show people this is happening right now. Good point. I use PF Blocker. Good. Is that PF Science? Is that? Yeah. It's a package for PF Science. All right, so I think uh, we're 23 seconds over. So um, <laughs> no! let's make sure we end our time. Thanks, guys. We have a coffee break now. Thanks for Ben and Phil. Thank you so much.